All right, so having talked about some problems, given specific examples of problems, an awful lot of specific examples of problems, now I want to pause for just a, just a second here to reflect on uh, some, some kind of general statements about problems and some, uh, some questions that, that sometimes arise in the context of problems. Okay, oops, went too far. Okay, so first is I want to describe the difference between a problem, an algorithm, and a program. All right, so let's see. So a problem here is, is a job. It's a task. Uh, maybe a little more precisely, it's, it's a uniform family of tasks. So uh, the, the best, best example here is, is the shortest path problem is, is, um, is, in general, you're given a network with weighted edges and you want to find the shortest path from one place to another. A specific instance of the shortest path problem is you're given New York and Los Angeles and asked to find the shortest path from New York to Los Angeles. So the problem is a, a uniform family of tasks and the instance is this one. Now usually we'll talk about problems much more than instances just because um, uh, sometimes there are special cases that, that, that where the instance makes a difference, but in general it feels sort of a little more natural to talk about the problem rather than the instance in particular. We are most focused, of course, on problems that can be solved with a mechanism. Although, as always, we continue to be interested in knowing that a problem can't be solved mechanically at all, that a Turing machine can't solve a problem, that will, that will continue to be a, a question that we're interested in. Okay, and so an algorithm. So an algorithm describes a high level and effective way to, to, to solve a problem. So an algorithm solves a problem. Algorithms and problems are different. An algorithm solves a problem. Now, an algorithm isn't an implementation, although an algorithm will be described in such a way that a person who is familiar with implementing will be, will be able to work through the details themselves. An important subtle point about algorithms is that while they are abstractions, they're nonetheless based on some underlying computing model. If you are writing an algorithm for Turing machines, then probably your algorithm is very different than an algorithm for, for RAM machines, and you need to translate the one to the other. If you're writing an algorithm for, uh, 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 let's see, distributed computation, probably your algorithm is very different than an algorithm you would write uh, for an ordinary CPU like you have in your desk or in, on your phone. Okay, and then finally down here we're at, oops, Lost my mouse again. There we go. Finally, we're down here at program. So a program is different than an algorithm in that it's an implementation of an algorithm, typically expressed in a specific form of computer language and often designed to be executed on a specific computing program, a specific computing platform. I mean, if you're writing a program in C to do something uh, that involves, let's say, uh, taking remainders, then you have to worry about what the CPU does when you're taking the remainder of a negative number. In an algorithm, you probably will leave that detail to the implementer, to the programmer. So the difference between an algorithm and a program is sort of the level of detail. A program works on a specific platform. An algorithm is designed to work on a model. Okay. Representations. So we'll assume that all the input and output for our, for our algorithms has some reasonably efficient representation and we'll, we'll assume it's as bit strings. So that is to say, although we will say, given two numbers, n0 and n1, natural numbers, we'll take that to mean given the bit string representation of those two numbers. Now, of course, it would be pedantic to say the second one, but nonetheless, from, on occasion, we'll, we'll have reason to notice the difference. Another example, one that's less obvious, is instead of saying, given a reasonably efficient representation of a graph, we'll just say, let G be a graph. Okay, so that is to say, it will always matter that we're inputting these things into our devices as representations, and we'll just assume that they're reasonably efficient. It will typically, not 100% of the time, but typically not matter to us exactly what is the representation as long as, as, long as it's, it wasn't made up in order to be a violation of what we're saying here. Okay, having made this observation now, from now on we're usually just going to ignore it. That is to say, later on in the chapter we'll say things like, let G be a graph. And we just simply won't worry about the exact representation because it won't matter for the kinds of conclusions that we're making later. Okay. 
So that brings me to the to the to the the heart the the key slide here in this video. The, uh, listing a couple of different problems. Now what's here is a little on the vague side. Sometimes problems don't really fall quite in one category or another, but nonetheless it doesn't mean that the categorization is totally useless. Okay, so a function problem asks that an algorithm have a single output for each input. If I, uh, if I asked you to, for example, find the prime factorization of a number, you're looking for a single output for each input. I'm giving you a number as input, and you're supposed to give as output the prime factorization. An optimization problem asks for an algorithm that gives a solution that's somehow best. Let's say, for example, the traveling salesman problem asks you to find the minimum distance. You can also imagine a traveling salesman problem that asks you for the minimum time, and they're not necessarily the same. If you drive on back roads, you might be going slower. Although it's a shorter distance, it takes you a longer time. A search problem may be less familiar. With a search problem, you ask for an algorithm that, that while there may, may be many solutions, it, it will stop when it's found any one. Example of a search problem is satisfact, satisfiability. We're looking to, to see, is there some substitution for the variables that makes the expression as a whole come out to be t? If you name one, I don't care if there's another one. I just want to know, is there one? A decision problem asks for an algorithm with a yes or no answer. So if for satisfiability you just want yes or no, you don't want to know what exactly is the substitution, then you're doing a decision problem. If for a traveling salesman problem, you just want to know, is there a way to travel around the United States in less than 16,000 kilometers? You just want a yes or no answer. You don't necessarily want to know what is the way. So that's a decision problem. You might remember the Entscheidungsproblem from the very first slide, very, very first video, very beginning of the course, when we talked about a decision problem for mathematics. You type in the statement from mathematics, and beep, beep, buzz, buzz, the machine, ding, outcomes, yes or no, that statement is true. Now, the, the most important class of problems here on the slide, they're all important, but the most important for us will be, often a decision problem is expressed as a language recognition problem, as a language recognition problem, where we're given some language and asked for an algorithm to decide if its input is a member of that language. So this might remind you of, for example, automata questions where we were trying to decide whether the input string is a member of the language. And this is one of the reasons why we express things in, in, in that way, is that we're trying to ask questions that are sort of uniform across the chapters. There are many reasons to go with language recognition problems. They're not the only problems, but there are many reasons for us to go with language recognition problems, and that's one of them. So I might have, for example, a language, oh, let's say, of... Um, uh, numbers that have uh, exactly two primes in their prime factorization, where there are two primes, exactly two, two primes in the factorization. I'm going to blame it on the tablet, but really my handwriting is not all that much better than that. So uh, I, will, uh, I will be given an, a number n, uh, uh, say it's some 12-digit number, and you're supposed to come up with an algorithm that looks at n and decides yes or no, is n a member of this language? Of course, I mean a reasonably efficient representation for n, but I'm not going to care about that. Is n a member of this language? I, I'm just simply wanting to know here, just simply wanting to know, is n one of these numbers? Okay, so we will express many of the problems that we look at as language decision problems. And then, uh, uh, just, just to close here, in this chapter, usually a problem means a language decision problem, usually. Often, we get, uh, we, often if we get a problem that isn't a language decision problem, then we'll recast it to one. So, for example, you know, we did lots of examples of problems, and this, one of the reasons is so that I could quote them here. Subset sum. It's given a set of numbers and a target number and decides if a, some subset adds to that target. So, for example, you might be given 100 numbers and a target is uh, 708 and asked, can you find a subset of the 100 that adds to 708? Now, that, as stated, that's not a language decision problem. So, instead, I can recast it as a language decision problem as the pair, ask, comma, t, where a subset of S adds to T. Oops. Oops, 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 oops. Typo. A subset of S adds to T. 
And some examples might be 19, 21, 52, 106, 40. And I can ask the question, is there a subset of the set that adds to 40? And of course, the first two add to 40. So the answer is yes. So this is a member of that set. Did I erase something that was supposed to be there? I did erase something that was supposed to be there. I apologize. Okay, so I, I recast what sounds like kind of a number problem, is a number problem, and I recast it here, uh, the combinatorial problem, as a language decision problem. Here's another example. You can see I got, I've got three examples on the slide. The vertex to vertex path problem. The problem, you're given a graph and two vertices, and you decide if there's a path between the two. You know, if you're given a map of the world, there's no way to drive from New York to London, so sometimes there's no path between two vertices. I can recast that in a pretty obvious way as a language decision problem. You're given a graph and two vertices, and you see that's a triple. The collection of graphs and pairs of vertices where there's a path in G between the two vertices. So I've turned this graph problem into a, into a language decision problem in a very straightforward way. Not supposed to be tricky, supposed to be straightforward. Shortest path, on the, on the other hand, we already talked about this a little bit, shortest path is given as an optimization problem, and there's a, a, a trick, a technique, to turn it into a language decision problem in such a way that although it might, you have to do some iteration to answer the optimization problem, nonetheless, uh, uh, you've recast it as a language decision problem. So it, what you do is you fix a bound B, a parameter B, and you consider the language um, where uh, you, you're looking at the graph G and V, V prime, where there's a path between the vertices of length bounded by B. So if you want to know, I have two vertices in a graph, New York, Los Angeles, and I want to know, is there a path between those two, is there a way to drive from New York to Los Angeles, that is less than 3,000 miles. So capital B is 3,000. So this is a language now. It's a set of graph, comma, vertex, comma, vertex, you see the B here? It's a set of graph, comma, vertex, comma, vertex, map of the United States, comma, city, comma, city, where you can get from city to city with less than B equals 3,000 miles. And some triples G, V, V prime are in there. Some triples G, V, V prime are not in there. So this is a language, and determining whether something is in this language is a language decision problem. To find the shortest path, of course, we saw this trick before. To find the shortest path, you can put in the graph, the, the city, the city, and now look at L sub 1. Okay, well, if the answer is the language to decision problem, the answer is no. That means there's, there's, that, that, it, there's no path of length 1. Is there a path of length 2? Well, take B equals 2. Is there a path of length 3? Look at the language of triples where B equals 3. Is there a path of length 4? Look at the language of triples where B is 4, and you get the idea. If there is a path, then iterating in this way, and asking the question for B equals 1, then B equals 2, then B equals 3, then B equals 4, if there is a path, you'll eventually get a yes answer, and at that point, you'll know the shortest path. Okay, okay just to close now, a complexity class is a collection of languages. Having talked about language decision problems, we're going to think about... We're going to spend the rest of the semester here, the, re the rest of the chapter, thinking about collections of language decision problems, collections of languages. Now, the term complexity is in complexity class there because the collections are often associated with some resource allocation. So we might, for example, think about the collection of languages where you can solve the language decision problem in n squared time. Or we might think about the uh, collection of languages where you can solve the language decision problem in uh, n cube space. So often there's some complexity uh, resource specification that goes into the, making the collection of languages. Okay, and we will spend, the, we're, uh, we're working up to, we'll spend the rest of the chapter now thinking about various complexity classes. What kinds of problems can you solve, for example, in polynomial time? What kinds of problems can you not solve in polynomial time? Kinds of questions. Okay, very good. Okay, bye.